Hello and welcome to another Swanick Live. It's great to have you here. And if you are a woman and you struggle with your sleep, then this is for you today. We have a wonderful expert on all things sleep and all things perimenopause and menopause. Uh, so if you are a woman going through that or about to go through that, if you're a woman who struggles with her sleep, uh, listen in because over the next 30 or so minutes, we're going to be doing everything we can to help you sleep better. Uh, I'm joined today by Katish Haberfield, who is the founder of Reclaim Your Life with Katish. And uh, Katish, it's great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, James. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And you're the founder of Reclaim Your Life with Katish, which helps women understand the life stage transition of perimenopause. So just tell us a little bit about how you got into this and what your area of expertise is. Yeah, sure. Um, I think with most things in life, we um, teach what we need to know and what we're going through based on our experiences. And the reason we do this is so that um, we can help others who are going through similar to us. So for me, it's coming up to my 45th birthday and um, when I started uh, experiencing quite dramatic changes in my life was around the age of 42 and I thought, what the heck is going on with me? Um, and so being a little bit of a research geek, I used Dr Google and started doing and reading all the things to try and figure out, as my kids say, why are you so angry, mum? <laughs> I'm not angry. There's nothing wrong with me. Um, and why, when I was having a glass of um, white wine, why I would suddenly break out in a sweat? Um, and sort of a whole bunch of things started to make sense to me. And I realised there's this unspoken thing out there that's called perimenopause. So perimenopause is the stage before menopause. And you know, women have a really hard time talking about their reproductive life as it is. You know, we're still in this day and age not comfortable with talking about words like tampons or pads or periods. And then suddenly there's this process as we're hitting middle life and our bodies start to look different. Um, we're still the same inner child inside, but our outward world is changing a little bit. We all about ideals about who we are what we look like, what beauty is, what success is, are starting to morph and to change. And then at the same time, our body changes and it can throw, throw out everything, sleep included. And so I just started to share my experiences and women started resonating that. And we've just been going on a journey together for the last few years to say, hey, I'm having trouble sleeping. Did you realise there's actually a biological reason for that at this time of your life and to help um, women go through this journey? Um, I'd understand that they're not alone and they're not going crazy, um, that they're perfectly, perfectly normal and there are some simple tools that can help them. Yeah, and what's the age group usually where women experience perimenopause or menopause? What's that, what's that age range? Yeah, so perimenopause can start, are you ready for it? Anytime from 35. So 35 to 55, it's quite a big age bracket. And it depends upon your body, your hormones, your level of stress um, and genetic factors. Um, 55 is roughly the age women go into menopause. Now, menopause is a difficult term because we can only say we're in menopause once it's been 12 months since our last period. So it's a retrospective term. And then um, you can get this amazing realisation that that's what you've gone through and things start to make sense. So perimenopause is the lead up to that and it's when changes start happening and women start to feel a little bit not themselves but they don't have a reason to understand why and there's actually 35 different things that go on in a woman's body and her brain um, that are a part of the perimenopausal stage. So, yeah, it's quite a wide bracket but 35 to 55. Yeah, and you've uh, actually created a Facebook group uh, for women aged between 35 and 55, and we'll put the link um, in the comments uh, wherever you're watching this at the moment. Uh, there should be a link down below. We'll put a link there to the Facebook group, um, and the Facebook group is named uh, Perimenopause and Menopause, Essential Oils and Natural Solutions. It's a private group, so we'll put the link down there below where you can um, access that. 
So what are some of the the sim- is it is it correct to say symptoms from perimenopause and menopause or is that uh, is that incorrect? Yeah, well, symptoms is kind of one word that we do use. Um, the medical industry, of which I'm not part of a medical industry, but um, uses the word symptoms. But um, the problem with using the word symptoms is it tr- kind of treats it like a disease. And I like to say that it's not a disease. It's just a life stage with indicators that you're out of, uh, you, your body is changing and that you're going out of alignment with some things in your life. Um, and that you need to take some pause, take care of yourself and pay attention to what your body's saying to yourself before you get full-blown um, experiences. I'm, I'm from the background whereby um, I, I believe and understand completely in um, the approach of I have a symptom, I have a hot flush and I need something to treat it, but I also believe in the wisdom of learning what your body's telling you. So what, what's the actual message behind that? What's the root cause behind it? There will be biological changes and physical chemical changes in your body, but there's also some emotional concepts as well. So um, it's really a, a period of time that a woman needs to learn to nurture herself, um, and that can be really difficult for a lot of women because they've been so busy nurturing their families and their partners and their parents may be getting older so they're used to nurturing them but they've really got out of practice of nurturing themselves and the true definition of self-care. Mm. So what are some of the signs that perimenopause or menopause has struck then? You mentioned some biological changes but then I, you also mentioned some emotional changes as well it seems. Yeah so anger is a really good sign. Um, what happens is that um at a fundamental level, our hormone, sex hormones change um, from, from that age. And men go through this as well, but a little bit later, and it's called andropause. Um, but w- for women, um, the changes happen not only in the ovaries, but in the limbic system as well. So it's the equivalent to uh, the changes that a teenager goes through at puberty, but it's just for women. And, and it's kind of like your sex hormone in sex hormones change in reverse. So a lot of women will notice changes in their um, progesterone levels and the estrogen levels. They will also see a um, change in the um, display of their testosterone. And um, uh, one of the other things that happens is their melatonin production changes as well quite dramatically. So it's it goes up and down and it can change according to the time of the day, um, the, the day of the week, the and where we are in the month. Um, But basically um, it's kind of like you have your um, estrogen drops dramatically dramatically as time goes by um, and so does your progesterone. Um, And when we start perimenopause, um, generally speaking, we um, can have high levels of estrogen and low levels of progesterone. Um, And in comparison, our testosterone may say... um, Stay high, and so what we get is the changes in the limbic system uh, combined with the changes in the hormones in the, um, the the whole uterus and the womb space can bring forward um, anger and frustration. So that's one of the number one sign is is um, anger and irritability. The things that you would normally put up with or tolerate in your life are suddenly uh, making you blow a fuse. So you're less able to deal with stress and your cortisol levels um, really um, increase a lot. Um, Another sign closely linked to that is um, waking up in the middle of the night. So there's two ways that you can wake up in the middle of the night. One is with a hot flush where you're literally waking up sweating. Um, And the second way can be that you can um, wake up with a panic attack or a a phase of anxiety um, and can't get back to sleep. And that can very quickly spiral into insomnia if you don't have some strategies and tactics um, to help you get back to sleep um, quickly or learn to get to self-soothe and to get back to sleep. Yeah, I want to um, dig into the I want to dig into the sleep aspects of this in just a mm, second. Mm. But is it a common thing that women mistake these, I don't want to use the word symptoms again, but they mistake these changes for something else other than um, than menopause or perimenopause, do they mistake it for just you know life is just happening or 
um, you know, circumstances and that they're, they're unaware of the actual physical changes that are going on in their bodies. Yeah, it's a really misunderstood term because we don't talk about it much. A lot of women will become highly emotional, so they may not only become angry, but they may feel overwhelmed. Um, they may become emotional in terms of um, cry a lot, especially, and so they may present themselves to the doctor um, eventually and um, just be, end up a crying mess and not know why they're there. And then what happens is that the doctor goes, oh, she's having a midlife crisis. Let's put her on some antidepressants which has been historically the way that you deal with hysterical women, um, which is where yeah. the whole term hysterectomy came from, which is get rid of the woman's womb so that she can function um, and not be such an emotional mess. Got it. And uh, <laughs> that's pretty antiquated thinking, at least in your, in your view, yes? Yeah, very antiquated because we have emotions for a reason, right? They're there to tell us that we... Um, have lots of thoughts about a particular topic or something's happening in our lives and we're not processing it or we want to process it. And, for example, the the emotion of anger is a boundary crossing. Um, when you feel angry in life, there's something that has been crossed. Someone has crossed your boundaries or you have let your standards down and you've let somebody cross your boundaries. And so it's actually an a important message to us to really check in with our inner wisdom and see what it is that is um, creating that emotional response in our body so that we can actually be doing things that are more in tune with what we should, not what we should do, but what we really want to do. Yeah. There's a combination of a lot of things and how, uh, in my view, of how to handle these things which don't involve um, getting a pill from a doctor or taking prescription yeah. drugs. I've personally done a lot of self-development programs, um, uh, you know, from Landmark Forum to Elevate Leadership Community to just, you know, going inside meditation, 10-day silent retreats called Vipassana. Um, a lot of different ways, in my view, that you can resolve, in some cases, childhood trauma. You can resolve a lot of the issues w around why you're getting triggered in, in day-to-day life that don't uh, need a doctor to, like I said before, prescribe a pill for you. Um, a lot of times these prescription pills also um, have shocking side effects and can do actually more damage long-term than what they may um, potentially alleviate short-term. Um, so certainly I'm in alignment with you there and taking a natural approach or natural and holistic approach, I would say, um, and not necessarily trying to, trying to resolve issues through prescription medication. Mm. And James, one of the things I know that you're particularly passionate about is um, alcohol and the, the over-reliance of alcohol in our lives. And um, in perimenopause, a lot, uh, a lot of women um, find that if they don't understand their, their anger and their frustration and their emotions, they may end up medicating themselves with a bottle of wine. Yeah. When you said um, you you know that you're very, I'm very passionate about alcohol, I was like, well, that's actually not quite yeah. correct. I'm very passionate about people not drinking as much alcohol or quitting yeah, alcohol. Yeah, that's what it, yeah, I wanted that's to what make I mean, that dis yeah. wanted to make that distinction there. Yeah, yeah but passionate um, about the role that alcohol plays in your life in a negative perspective is what I yeah. mean. So, um, and interestingly, um, during perimenopause, with all the changes in the hormones the act of simply drinking alcohol can actually induce a hot flush. So drinking alcohol can be a very unpleasant experience for a woman in this period of time. But um, if you're not really in tune with your body um, and don't understand the reason behind it, you may just plow on anyway and just, um, just think it's suddenly really strange that when you drink your favourite glass of red or whatever, that you suddenly um, sleep your sleep is more disturbed and you might wake up in the middle of the night with a hot flush if you don't get one immediately upon consuming alcohol. Yeah. Um, and just on that, um, you mentioned red wine there. If, if uh, Red wine and beer actually have the most toxins in it of, of, of all of the, the different alcoholic drinks that you can have. So while it's true that having some alcohol at night may indeed help people feel sleepier and fall asleep, 
your sleep quality is going to be severely compromised. Um, a lot of people mistakenly feel like alcohol is a good way to reduce stress and anxiety and to wind down uh, from the end of the day. But sadly, what's actually happening is that you're pouring attractively packaged poison down your throat. You're disrupting your uh, sleep patterns. You're disrupting your melatonin production. Um, your body is not fully rested. You don't spend as long in that deep REM restorative phase of sleep during the night. Um, which is why when you wake up, even if you've had seemingly seven hours of like, you think it's undisturbed sleep. And in most cases it is disturbed sleep, but even if you have seven or eight hours of undisturbed sleep, at least what you perceive to be undisturbed sleep, often you still wake up feeling tired and lethargic. It's because the sleep quality was compromised by that seemingly innocent glass of wine that you had before you went to sleep. Um, you mentioned before about uh, melatonin production and perimenopause. So just explain to us a little bit about how uh, perimenopause affects the body's ability to create melatonin, which of course is the hormone that helps us sleep. Yeah, so it's, just, um, it's quite simply it happens in both males and females. So um, from the age of 35, our melatonin production decreases. Um, it just goes on the on the slide on the slide. I don't have a diagram to show you, but I know that people like Dr. Jockers, J O E C K E R S, has a a great uh, graphic um, on his website that shows you um, melatonin production. And so, if you're not naturally producing the melatonin, you start to get the um, sleep issues. And so, what you need to do is obviously to start learning how to encourage um, melatonin production and to do things like lock your blue light in, um and to to help um with the whole sleep process and you basically need to l learn how to sleep i think we learn we teach our toddlers how to go to sleep but quite often we don't teach ourselves as adults how to how to go to sleep and how to create a sleep ritual so that um, we have a process whereby we um set up ourselves for success at night. And that's what I'm I'm really quite passionate about is teaching people to really take the time and cultivate the space to acknowledge the importance of sleep on their health, acknowledge the importance of taking care of yourself and really being a little bit selfish in terms of respecting yourself and the sacredness of your bedroom and the sacredness of a sleep ritual every day single night yeah uh walk us through your sleep ritual Katish. yeah our, in our house um we've added little bits and pieces to our sleep ritual over the last sort of nine years and we add a, a new layer at a time um because we like to experiment and also uh, we different changes in our lives but for us um and I have two teenage boys, um, one who is a, a, um, an, an owl, he's a, a night boy, and the other one who's a lark. I'm a bit of a lark. I like to get up early. So I naturally want to go to sleep about 8.30 at night. Um, but for us, the process of sleep starts around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. For us, it's about acknowledging that we're about to come into dinner time and we need to start to um, wind up all the busy activity of the day. I'm a little bit um, of a taskmaster when it comes to the evening in terms of, um, and it's going to be more and more difficult as my children get higher up in the high school um, grades, but at the moment we have a ritual of like six o'clock is dinner and you have to have had a shower by six o'clock, which is I know for a lot of families is like, ah, we're not even home yet. But for me, a shower before dinner uh, starts to unwind the, the body to relax the muscles and there's something just so relaxing about the water for helping you get rid of all those excess energetic thoughts from the day as so you cleanse it away. Um, and once we've had dinner, we have a rule of um, you have to um, turn off all devices. Um, so the only time devices are allowed at night time is on the weekend, um, but normally all screens are off. Um, we dim the lights. Um, all of our devices are set so that the 
um, the nighttime setting comes on at, at five o'clock. So we're starting to create that association with dimmer lights, less noise. Um, we're starting to, we've got into our pyjamas, we're, we're, we're more relaxed, and then we turn our diffusers on in all the rooms. Um, each of us have different sensory cues, so we all have our own customised blends that we use, and the diffusers go on to signal to our um, brain that these particular aromas are getting us ready to unwind to go to bed. Um, and then because our bedrooms are for sleep only, there's no school desks in there. Um, they're not for play either. Um, so there's no toys in the bedrooms and um, we don't have bright lights in there. We use um, salt lamps in the bedrooms and the bathrooms. So if you need to go to the toilet in the night, you don't need to turn on massive fluoros or anything to that jolts you back in. Um, and then it's a re- an hour of reading before bed um, or listening to a meditation or a sound, a bit of sound uh, music or binaural beats or a hypnotherapy. And then um, I'm quite mindful of making sure that a room has adequate ventilation so it's not too hot, not too cold, um, and that the boys are set up so that we each have um, – our own weighted blankets to go to sleep under because we like the feeling of weight. And then we either have an eye pillow or an eye mask um, because I always used to go to sleep like this. (laughs) And then I was like, uh, you know, a mask or a pillow would be a whole lot easier than sticking your hand over there until it sort of falls off with pins and needles. So that just that pressure over your face helps go to sleep. And um, there you go, you drift off pretty much. Yeah, you mentioned a couple. You mentioned a couple of things there. I know you sell some, some produce some products for that. Just a shout out to your your website. If you go to shop.katish.com, uh, Katish is K-A-T-I-S-C-H-E dot com. Um, I think you sell some. Uh, you've got a. You certainly got a book there, haven't you? You've produced a book, and you've got some essential oils. I think for sleep, is that right, Katish? Yeah, I have a um, an ebook that you can purchase. And it goes through the um, and identifies the particular essential oils that have sedative properties. So, when we, if you decide that you're interested in using uh, aroma as a sleep based tool, then there's a lot of oils out there, and there's lots of different blends and 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 types of types of essential oil aromas. And it can be like um, pouring money down the drain if you don't know why something works a certain way and so I've created a guide which basically tells you which oils have sedative properties and why and that way you can focus your money on buying the oils that have actually got sedative properties so for example clary sage has sedative properties and um, frankincense and hawaiian sandalwood Um, so my brain just works as I need to know the reason why something's good for sleep so yeah but there's a whole range of tools so grab that book, grab some of those oils, and then you can use a Swanick diffuser to actually um, oh. use some of those oils. You were mentioning lights as well. We've actually got um, a Swanick company has come out with a, um, a light bulb here, which has stripped away all of the blue light, which is responsible for messing with your melatonin production. So, uh, Perfect. Yeah, we've, um, it's uh, a yellow... It has a little yellow bulb in nature and then you put them in your bedside lights and it creates a very calming, soothing light, which is uh, has uh, no blue light in it. And then, of course, if you're watching this and you're an existing Swannies customer, you already know this, but wearing a pair of blue light blocking glasses in the last hour or so before you go to sleep, um, wearing these glasses as well will continue to block out that artificial blue light that you may be you know, staring into right now, quite frankly, if you're watching this, this, uh, this interview on a phone or a screen of some kind, um, putting that orange lens up to the screen there would block out that artificial light. Your body is then able to produce melatonin the way that nature always intended it, uh, to produce melatonin, as opposed to if you're scrolling through your phone, for example, and, uh, <clears throat> you're staring into that light it's stimulating your pituitary and pineal gland, which suppresses your melatonin production. 
Um, another thing um, which you didn't mention that I would offer, Katish, is exposing um, yourself to as much natural sunlight first thing in the morning. Um, our skin has receptors in it, and when the sunlight hits our skin, um, you know, minutes after waking up, it tells our internal body clock, which is named our circadian rhythm, this is wake up time. And so our body floods with daytime uh, hormones. There's a lot of cortisol actually in the first 20 minutes or so um, in, the, in the morning, which is good. We want that initially, but then after that, we want a very, very low levels of cortisol. And then if you, if by exposing yourself to that natural sunlight first thing in the morning, in actual fact, 12 to 16 hours later, your body is actually then going to want to um, naturally start to flow with melatonin and start to prepare itself for sleep. Sadly, most people in the modern world will wake up and stay indoors for at least a couple of hours um, before act actually even leaving their home and exposing themselves to sunlight. Um, but if you can do it, even if you stand by a window, for example, and just let the sun, right, sun come in and hit your skin for five minutes, that you will actually find that your sleep will noticeably improve. Um, any I'm thoughts? a big fan of that. Yeah, big fan of that. Sunglasses off when you first uh, get, go out of the house in the morning. I uh, preach that to a lot of friends. Take your sunnies off. <laughs> um, and I, we naturally go, we've got a vergola, so let open that straight away in the morning to, to let that light in. Um, yeah, really important. I think that people um, overuse the sunglasses. You, you need to let that light in. Yeah. Uh, we're talking to Katish Haberfield here, who is the founder of Reclaim Your Life with Katish. Uh, why don't you give a little shout out there on your, to your Facebook and Instagram and YouTube pages and website, Katish, before we move on? Yep. So the easiest way to find me is uh, katish.com and then at katish.com it's got all the little icons that you can click on to go to my other social media accounts but they're usually underscored katish what's really the first step for a woman who might be watching this and who now suspects that they may have some perimenopause starting to kick in but they're not sure like how do they confirm that this is actually what what is going on versus some other health issue sure um, well, the first thing would be to just grab some awareness about your body, start paying attention to the things that you're feeling, see if your cycle's starting to change. You can go to the doctor and ask them to confirm it, but they'll do a blood test. But to be honest, most um, obstetrician, gynecologists and doctors these days will say the hormones fluctuate so much that I could give you a test today and, that, and it'll be different than tomorrow. So it's more about feeling into the situation, whether you feel any different and then just being aware of the changes in your body. But a good place is to start. You can go onto my blog and, and read about perimenopause or come and join the Facebook group and just ask questions from people. Just start the conversation. Hey, I've been feeling this. What do you think? Are you feeling the same thing? Because a lot of women, once you start to talk about this, they'll go, oh, my God, yes. I didn't really want to say it to anybody, but I've been feeling that too. You mentioned uh, you have two boys. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And how old are you? How old are your boys, Katish? Uh, one boy is uh, turning twelve this week, and the other is just about to turn fourteen. So and ha have there been periods of their life, like an age range, where you have found that as a mother you have slept? better or slept worse or, or your sleep has felt more challenged um you know has, has your sleep progressively got better as they've got older or has it has it been more challenged as they've got older like can you speak to that a little um i think that each child has a different personality so um my young youngest has always slept differently to my eldest um my body rhythm changed completely when i had kids so Prior to having kids, I was the night owl. I was always up late. I like to read late into the night um, and I wouldn't have any troubles with that. But as soon as I had my eldest child, he was awake from five and I just learned to be awake from, from five. And so he's nearly 14 now and my body has changed. I'm up. I can't sleep in. He can't sleep in. Um, so that's fine. I've, I've changed. The other one, the little one, has always been a very light and restless sleeper um, and has always um, 
been a night owl. So for me, a lot of um, learning about sleep has been to help assist him fall to sleep. He's a lot more of a device kid too. So my next stage is obviously getting him a pair of swannies himself so that when he's spending time on the Xbox, he can wear his daytime swannies. So that's my next purchase. Um, so that he's uh, we're reducing that um, blue light even in the daytime for him. I think um, I'm rocking a pair so of the like, daytime swannies, uh, daytime yeah. swannies here with uh, the clearer lens. You can actually see the blue light bouncing off the lens. You see how the blue light doesn't penetrate the lens? It's quite interesting, yeah. isn't it? Because there's not there's not actually a, there's there's no blue really on the screen that I'm looking at at the moment. But in the reflection, you can see that it's very clearly blue. So the blue light that is being emitted from the screen is literally bouncing off that lens. So yeah, a pair of daytime glasses um, and kids are actually, and children are most susceptible to blue light exposure because as we age, we actually um, start to build more of a, um, uh, of a barrier to blue light. But when we're very young, that barrier hasn't really progressed. And so these kids who are staring into iPads or computer, staring at TV screens and staring into light, um, they're doing, they're, they're potentially doing a, a lot of um, not just physical damage to the eyes, but behavioral damage as well, because lack of sleep or poor sleep because of that exposure leads to irritability and irritability leads to eating junk food crappy food and eating crappy food leads to more irritability and so forth and becomes this vicious cycle. Yes. And I think that a lot of families will have noticed um, with lockdown um, when the kids were at home here for that period of time and their entire school day was eight hours on a laptop. It's hard for them to unwind after that amount of exposure. So yeah, um, yeah they, they would have been a lot a lot more helpful if they were sitting there with those laptops and the glasses on. I can tell you that now in hindsight. You've got, have you got a pair of Swannies, Katish? No, I don't have a pair of Swannies. It's one, been one of those things, you know, where you, you walk the walk and you don't actually, well, you talk the talk and sometimes you don't walk the walk. So don't worry, we'll get onto it this week. It's, until yeah. now. You don't have a pair of Swannies until now. We'll make sure oh, yeah, that we get yeah. you there. <laughs> um, for, for women who are watching this, um, th- and thank you so much for your guidance and expertise on this. We really appreciate you um, helping out our community, certainly the Swannies community. But for women who are, who are watching this, what would be your um, overarching um, piece of advice for them, especially I think for a woman between 35 and, and 55 who may be experiencing some of those, um, those behavioural or physical changes that you referenced? Yeah, so number one thing is you're not alone. Every um, woman on the planet goes through it, whether she's given birth or not. It's the way that you're desired. Two, change happens. Um, It can freak us out or we can learn to adapt and to surrender and go with the flow. Um, And the only way that you can, can do that is to become more mindful about your body and your feelings. And um, take really small steps, build yourself a nurturing self-care ritual every day. And in particular, pay attention to your sleep because if you can't sleep at night, then you're irritated, um, frustrated and crankier than normal during the day. You don't have patience with your children. You can't think clearly at work. And it's a, a self, um, it goes around and around in circles. So the, the the most nurturing thing you can do for yourself is to build yourself a really beautiful nighttime ritual around sleep and really honour your need to sleep um, and don't give in to the culture of busyness and compromise your sleep. Wonderful. Katish Haberfield, thank you so much for your time and your guidance and expertise. I so appreciate you. Remember that you can... Uh, f- learn more at shop.katish.com. That's K A T I S C H E dot com. Uh, and you can find her on Instagram as well, which is underscore Katish. Um, maybe send her a message over there. Uh, tell that you uh, saw her and listened to her on this show and this episode. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. <laughs>